Welcome back. Nancy and I are really excited because joining us via Skype right now, we have Dr. Robert Schultz. He's the director of the Center for Autism Research, C-A-R, CAR. They're a multifaceted research program at CHOP, working to understand the causes of autism spectrum disorders and to develop better treatments. The, the group's research addresses the basic mechanisms that support social communication, attention, and the biology of reinforcement-based learning, which is a mouthful, but really important. And you guys probably are more familiar with Dr. Schultz because, in fact, we covered it here on the right. show. There was a study just a couple of months ago that got everybody's attention looking at predicting autism using MRI and looking at a phenomenon that happens that we're going to talk to Dr. Schultz a little bit more to see what he saw. So first of all, Dr. Schultz, uh, you've got a, a resume that is amazing. You are a very impressive gentleman, and we're lucky to have you working on the field of autism. That's kind of you to say. I appreciate it. Well, we're, we're really excited to have this opportunity to talk with you. So we covered r the rudimentary parts of the study here on the show, but neither one of us is a scientist. So let's start with what did your study set out to find? Okay, so we want to understand the earliest manifestations of autism. Um, that's kind of hard to study because, in general, it's hard to predict who's going to uh, go on to have autism. So we had to use a, a specific uh, group of kids to look at, and those are kids where there's already a brother or a sister with autism. Um, we, know, we call those high-risk samples or baby sibling samples. Um, so if we were to study just the general population, we would have to study hundreds and hundreds of kids just to get a few kids with autism. But if we study a high-risk sample, about one out of five or 20% will have autism. And you're looking to um, find the earliest possible moment that you can identify in the brain when it's happening? Is that correct? That's correct, but even more than that. It's not just the brain. We want to look at the behavior as well. Um, because we don't know the first signs of autism from a research point of view because we're usually not there to study it. It usually happens and it goes on for a period of months before a parent would come to a clinician, before a clinician might then suggest a research study. And, and so we've been, in, as a scientific community, we've been in the dark about the very, very earliest or the onset of autism. Okay. Um, okay. And we think that's going to provide clues that, that you just otherwise don't get. So tell us what the study, what did you find out with the study? So we found out that in the first year of life that the, brain, the rate of brain growth is different in kids who go on to have autism. And why and is that? Do we know? Um, we can speculate. We can speculate. But maybe I should tell you a little bit more specifically okay. about the kinds of changes we saw. Um, so the, the brain, as you know, has neurons and, and connections. The connections are white matter. The neurons are gray matter. They, they actually literally look gray if you look at the brain. Um, and the outside of the brain is the big part. It's the cortex. That's the part that's most uh, you know, enlarged in humans compared to any other animal. Um, and the rate of the growth of the cortex in particular regions was uh, uh, happening very quickly between 6 and 12 months of age. So if you look at the, just the, the, the growth rate, that told us at age 2 who was going to have autism. Um, and that's important for a couple reasons, but your, your, your last question was on why might that be. Um, it's definitely something that, and what we used for this um, study was MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is great for giving us really clear pictures of the brain, the brain anatomy, the different poles, um, but it can't see cells. It can't see the individual neurons in the brain. So the question of why is it happening is something that an MRI can't tell us. Um, but there's been a lot of other research that provides strong hints as to why. Um, so we, we being the community, not my lab, have studied animals um, where we might engineer them to have an autism risk gene. We know that there's you know 100 or so autism risk genes. If you put them in an animal, you can uh, you can find features of autism, such as a, a brain that grows too fast in the first year of life. Um, and when that happens, it's because you, you've heard of stem cells, haven't you? Yes, yes, of course. So stem cells are kind of um, pluripotent. They can, they can develop in any direction. Um, the 
the stem cells in the brain are special because they um, they grow during the first weeks of life. And you don't actually don't get neurons or other or, or types of neurons. You just get stem cells. It turns out that when you have a lot of stem cells born in the first you know, 50 days of life, you get an overall bigger brain. So it's possible that the roots of this could go back to early prenatal development, that there's more stem cells being born. And after about day 50, those stem cells begin to uh, give rise to daughter cells, which are all sorts of different kinds of neurons, specific names, like you know, rejection neurons or local circuit neurons. That's not, that, that those things don't um, dictate or predict the, the ultimate size of the brain. So it's probably something in the timing of early divisions of cells in the first 50 days of life. Um, but we don't know that from our data, right? So we know that we've seen the brain size increase uh, in a very specific way, in a very specific part of the cortex. And we know from animal research why that is. Um, but we, 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 So we're now speculating that we can use the animal research to guess why it is in, in the kids that we study. So is that, is that, what, yeah, that yeah. certainly helps. Yeah. That's interesting to know. When your study came out, all the headlines were saying, you know, that there was a possibility of another way of looking to predict early autism. And we know that the earlier the diagnosis, the, the better the outcomes tend to be. Um, right. But does this suggest then that people should start having their children get MRIs really young? Not yet. Um, it's, it's, this was a, a big study, you know, and it took 10 years to do the study, believe it or not. Um, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be prudent to, to rush and, and do that. Uh, good science means we should replicate it first. We should, we should actually do the study again. And, and we should, and we should estimate with precision, what is the accuracy of this test? So in our study, we were about 90% accurate in predicting who would get autism, um, which is good. Um, but from a public health perspective, sometimes even 90% isn't good enough to warrant the expense of an MRI. Um, but more importantly, I think, is we need to, we need to be really confident in that number, 90%, and we need to, we need to have, um, we need to know the range of possible predictions. And tell we us again know. how young you were able to predict it with this, with your, with your technology. So at 12 months of age, we could predict. It's amazing. Because it yeah. was that the rate of growth between 6 and 12. So we had to look at both the 6-month brain and the 12-month brain. So we had to get two MRIs. And, and 15 of the children in the original study ended up being diagnosed with autism. Had they all started treatment? So um, I'm sure they have. We have not followed them up uh, to track that. Our, our, we, we get, fortunately, uh, nice funding from the NIH and the NIMH and the NICHD. Um, but we haven't yet uh, gotten follow-up money to, to ask those really important questions. Um, we've applied, and, and we're hopeful that we will. Um, and many of these kids now are, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And so we're really curious what, there's, as you all know, autism is heterogeneous. So some of these kids will be doing really well, some will be doing less well, some of them will do well in school but not socially, and so on. We want to know if we can actually understand more than just this binary classification, do you have autism or not, but, you know, what predicts uh, very specific outcomes? What predicts who responds well to certain kinds of treatments? Um, all those things are questions which would be important to get answers to. Yeah, and so funding is what's preventing you from being able to get those answers at this point? Correct. Um, I, I don't know how much you know about um, the lives of researchers, but we live and breathe on funding. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we're, we're what you call soft money. We're always applying for grants, and the research we do is the research we get funded to do. And, it, and it's um, it, it, it can be unpredictable uh, how that's going to work out. And we haven't really talked about this, but is there a, a a risk associated with getting MRIs when a child is really young? Is there any negative to doing this? There are no known risks for MRI. Um, it doesn't involve, like x-rays, it doesn't involve what's called ionizing radiation. It's really a big, uh, it's a big magnet and an FM, run, FM radio signal. It's, it's like an FM radio station that you plug and aim it at the brain while it's in the magnetic field. And, and the resonance is because the water molecules in the brain uh, resonate, they wiggle. And, and we perturb the wiggle with the FM radio station. Um, 
I didn't know that. <laughs> Good to know. Well, I, I think the biggest question is here, how do people find out more uh, so that if you're doing another study and they want to participate and if heaven help us, if there's somebody out there who's got a checkbook and wants to yeah. write you a check to, to exactly. further look at this study, where would they go? So um, I can give you some websites for us. Um, you can, check, can I read them to you? Yes, sure. please. So there's www and then all one word, which is our, our name of our organization, Center for Autism Research dot org. Um, and, and you can find out more about our research, you know, if you go to the research and news section. Um, people who are interested in, in helping with the study could email me directly if they wish, and I'm, I'm happy to give you that email. Okay. Um, and that's Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z, R-T for my initials, Robert Thomas, at chop dot edu. Okay. All right. And we can, uh, any any else? I, any others? I should say that this work is. Um, I, I want to make it clear. We, we are one of several sites who, who work together. So you're, you're talking to me, um, but there are a lot of other people throughout the country who help. So there's a group in Seattle. There, uh, the the main group is actually in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. There's a group in uh, St. Louis. So the children came from all of these groups. Um, and we now have 500 children who have enrolled and who we've evaluated up through 36 months. Um, so it's important uh, really to wait to 36 months to understand the diagnosis. And so we will be publishing many, many more things about this over the next couple of years, uh, as well as we're hopeful we'll get funding to, to understand how these early signs help us understand you know, later outcomes. I just want to know, at what point did you get excited and go, I, we, we really have something here? Uh, you know, it, 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 believe it or not, <laughs> nine years into it, um, that's the nature of research. You have to you'd be able to you know, stick with the things for a long time because you, you can't, in, in a reproducible and reliable way, look at your results and you have enough people in the sample. Yeah. Um, and the kinds of... Um, analyses we did on the brain and the kind of statistics we did really required a big team of people. So it, it, it takes time. But no, we all slogged away for many hours and for many years, um, knowing that it was an important thing to do regardless of what we found. We've known for a long time that kids with autism on average have bigger heads and bigger brains. We just didn't know the origin of it. Um, and we didn't know when it began and we didn't know if it would predict. We didn't know if we could see features in the first year of life that would understand help us understand what a child will be like when they're two or three. So that was the kind of risky part. That was the thing we were hoping would find. It's a really big deal, and I, and I, I just want to thank you. We want to thank you for the work that you did in having that patience because I do think that moving forward in the next decade, it's going to make a huge difference. I do, too. I think this is really important. The existing, so there's no other way to predict autism in the first year of life. And the existing tools, which are generally like uh, parent questionnaires, really aren't that accurate. And they're not, they're not even functional until age, say, two years of age. So it's really not predicting well, autism. And, it's and, and to piggyback onto autism. that, let's, let's say this, yeah. that both Nancy and I are autism parents. And, you know, people don't listen to autism parents. <laughs> A lot of times so you have, can tell have, a pediatrician and right, they won't listen. To have yes. something to point to and say, look, it's right here. It's not in my head. This is what's happening. That's a huge gift that you've given to the autism parents. And, and this might be a question that you don't have the answer to at this point, but um, when do you think something like this would be available mainstream in, in a, on a wider spread basis if your research continues to go as you anticipate? So the, the, the process will unfortunately take years. Um, there'll have to be, I think there'd have to be another study that prove that this wasn't a one-time fluke, this result. Um, and then you'd have to go through the process of getting an indication through the FDA. There's an application process and a proof process. And that, that would take also several years. So um, unfortunately, there's nothing quick about this. But that's, that's wise, because you don't want to expose families to the trouble and the hopes, the false hopes of MRI in the first year of life, or the, the expense of it, uh, until you're really certain. So. Uh, although it's hard to wait, I, I, I think it's the right call. Well, you have our support, and thank you so much. You have our gratitude as well. This is uh, really amazing, and uh, 10 years work, but it's really paying off. 
Uh, we want to thank you and everyone there at the Center for Autism Research. And we, whenever you have something you'd like to share, we'd love to have you come back. back. I would love to come back. We have a lot of cool stuff, so you'll be hearing. All okay. right. Thank I you, Dr. Schultz. Thank Schultz. you Thanks. so much. Right. Bye-bye. Okay. Really amazing. Yeah. I, when I think about 10 years ago where I was when mm -hmm. they started this and how I hoped that there were people, that there were brighter minds yes. who were doing something. I'm not a patient person. Yeah. I, I like that bone I did not get <laughs> when I came out. But 10 years goes by in the blink it of an eye. It goes by in the blink of an eye. Um, and, and here we are and we know more than we did then. It really gives me chills to mm -hmm. think about the fact that they were there slogging away right. at it, uh, taking the data and doing whatever, and parents were participating and taking their kids in and yeah. getting MRIs and wondering, is any of this ever going to mean anything to anybody? But if we get to the point, let's, let's talk about this just for a second. If we get to the point where kids can be reliably diagnosed at 12 months, it will save so much time. Yes. It will save so much money. It will save so much heartache. And also, it will save people from wondering because if they, if they don't have a clear idea, if they think their child might have autism, but there's, you know, their pediatrician might be saying, oh, yep. they're a late talker. It or, will get rid of they, incompetence right, right, on the personal right. level. Um, and, you know, we always talk on the show, the reason why we talk about early intervention is. Uh, it's just like anything else. If you get behind in your house payments, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, I'm only one month behind. Right. But I still have to make the one this month, mm -hmm. right? And this is when, when the whole housing collapse happened and people said, how did so many people get foreclosed upon? Because if you start getting behind, you still have to keep up with what's going on. Same thing for our kiddos. So if they miss the milestones at a year, eh, but now they're supposed to be working on the ones that happen at 14 months right. and they're still working on them. So you just get further and further. So if you get to a child who's eight years old, what we have to catch up on is so much while they keep being bombarded by new stuff that mm -hmm. often it's it makes it really difficult, if not possible, to completely get caught up. Mm -hmm. Whereas we know for some of the kids that are being diagnosed at 15 months, right. Those kids are getting to be the age three and not having an autism diagnosis right. and go through their life and are fine because we're catching them before they're so far behind. Mm -hmm. My son diagnosed at two and a half. It took us five years to get caught mm -hmm. up. My you son diagnosed, diagnosed at four and at four or three and a half to four and started therapy at four and three quarters. Right. So. And it's an endless battle right. to get right. caught up and, to, right. and you still have to deal with the medical things right. and you've got to deal with other things. It's hard on the parents. It's hard on the kids. You, you know, it just, it makes such a difference if we can get there earlier. And I think for parents, peace of mind too, to know, oh, okay, it is autism. We don't have to guess. We can look at it on an MRI. There right. it is. It's right. autism. This is, and to know, you know, which type of autism, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it will. It's going to make a tremendous it, difference. It sure is. What a what a, what a body of work uh, to to have done. You know, yeah. we, we hear all the time people will say, you know, they're they're working the first line of their obituary, right? Right. Um, a, a, a maudlin way of looking yeah. at it, but it means that what you're doing is so important right. that it's what will be said about you when you're no longer here. We want to thank everybody at uh, CAR, and we want to thank everybody. Um, we want to thank Beery Diana for making sure that we got this interview. Yeah, this is a great interview.